Hi everybody, welcome to our next video. Uh, this is going to be the first of two dangers that helpers face. Um, and it's about the idea of dishonesty. The reason we're talking about it is because a higher purpose can be ethically dangerous. Uh, we use helping behavior as an excuse to engage in bad behavior. And I'm going to show you a multitude of reasons why that's true. And then we'll have some, some recent compelling examples that we'll talk about in class. Uh, to begin with, I want to introduce this as I want to introduce this idea of moral regulation. Um, essentially, the way this works, and this is a phenomenon that comes from psychology research, we have this baseline level of normal that we consider ourselves to be when it comes to our good and bad behavior. There, we we're sort of like a baseline level of good uh, that we consider to be normal. We're not terrible people, but we also know that we're not perfect people. If we've been especially good lately like we've engaged in some sort of good behavior that's above our baseline, then what we'll do is we'll use that as an excuse to engage in bad behavior, sort of bringing ourselves back to a normal baseline. If we've been worse than normal lately, if we've engaged in especially reckless or bad or selfish behavior, then we'll do things to make up for it and to compensate so that we can make ourselves feel better about who we are. And this idea of preserving this self-image is a really important one. And so that's why we'll do this to recover from our bad behavior. Well, the, the recovery is a, is a kind of phenomenon called moral cleansing, where you've been bad, so you'll act better to make yourself feel normal. But the other kind, where you've been good and, in fact, better than normal, and because you, you realize that you've been good, you sort of use that as an excuse to be bad, that's something called moral licensing. And I want to talk more about how moral licensing works. And the research has shown up in a lot of ways. You can get people to give less to charity if you remind them of why they're so great. Uh, people will uh, who have bought, who have spent more money on, on environmentally friendly products will be more likely to cheat or steal. Uh, we see it showing up in a number of other kinds of behavior, the likelihood of somebody helping strangers, the willingness to admit error, or, uh, or uh, keeping agreements or promises that you've made. All of these are examples of things that have shown up where more licensing is at work, meaning that people will engage in worse behavior in all of these domains if they have a reason to think that they've been better than normal lately. Um, in fact, this is such a strong effect that even just anticipating moral behavior can generate a licensing effect. So if somebody is planning to make a donation that they haven't made yet, we'll still get them to engage in moral licensing. Uh, there's been another study that was really interesting that showed that part of moral licensing might be described by something called mental accounting. Mental accounting is a phenomenon from behavioral economics where what we do is we we sort of, even though all money is equivalent, every dollar is equivalent to every dollar, with, with uh, mental accounting what we do is we assign certain dollars to certain budgets or activities. And so you might say like, oh, you know, people do this, for example, with envelope based uh, budgeting, where they'll put $200 for their um, utility bills for that month into an envelope. The reality is that $200 can be spent on anything, but we have a tendency to like treat money as special for different purposes. We just set it aside in our head. Well, there's another follow-up study that was done on moral licensing that showed that this might be a, an explanation for some kind of moral licensing because we actually will budget our helping efforts. And so that means, for example, let's say you've helped two people move in the same week and now a third pe person needs help moving. You're going to be like, eh, I'm not going to do that. You might still be willing to help in other ways, but you're sort of like you've used up your budget of helping somebody unpack a truck. Uh, I know I keep coming back to the example of moving. It just is a, is a common one we encounter all the time. Uh, it's worth noting, though, there are some replication concerns in all this research around moral licensing. Uh, one thing that they're discovering is the effect maybe isn't as strong as people thought, but it is. But there is still plenty of evidence to show that there is an effect. And so the idea is that if you're a helper, you are constantly coming up. If you're if you're somebody who's helping others frequently, then you're coming up with reasons to engage in moral licensing, and you're using these as excuses, these helping uh, opportunities as excuses to engage in unethical behavior. And I want to talk about the detailed ways we might engage in bad behavior because we've been helpful to somebody else. 
Um, in fact, it may be in the process of helping that we engage in bad behavior because the help becomes the higher purpose and we use that end as a way to justify unethical means. So one example of that is in dishonesty. And there's interesting research on honesty and how trust works and the reasons that we trust people. One of the reasons we trust somebody is because they've shown integrity and that makes sense. But another reason we were willing to trust someone is because of their benevolence. If they've been generous, we're more likely to trust them, even if we don't know anything about their integrity. And benevolence-based trust can be, can be abused. And what that leads to is something called pro-social lying or pro-social cheating, where basically somebody's generosity makes other people believe them or credulous to them. And, uh, and so pro-social lying shows up, for example, people will lie to create a just outcome. Uh, to make up for something that they think was wrong. Uh, people will lie for revenge, for example. Uh, we will lie to protect those close to us. This happens in innocent ways, like if somebody just needs encouragement and they don't need the truth in a given moment. Um, but we might also lie to protect a loved one from consequences. A parent might, for example, help, a, help their kid cheat on a test, uh, you know, because they care about them getting an A. Um, or they might help a, help their kid lie to get out of an uncomfortable social situation. Um, and then finally, my kids, by the way, I just got to say, have frequently asked me to lie to help them out of an awkward social situation. And I refuse and they hate me when I do that. <laughs> but anyway, this is an example of pro-social lying. And then we might also engage in pro-social lying to defend the disadvantaged. Uh, you know, to sort of give somebody an upper hand because we feel like they've gotten a raw deal and so we'll be dishonest to their favor. So you can see how dishonesty can be used for good purposes, or at least what we think are good purposes, but it still violates ethical standards. Another thing that people will do uh, uh, where they will use unethical means to justify some higher end is that when we're helping people, we're often more willing to ignore their agency. You see this in informal ways where if you're helping somebody, you might just assume things on their behalf. You might do things that they don't want you to do. Um, you might sign them up for something that they shouldn't have, that they wouldn't have signed up for on their own. Uh, an example of where I think this gets especially frustrating, at least for me, is in the, the context of something called poverty porn. Poverty porn is a term used for when net, uh, NGOs or nonprofits will portray their beneficiaries as helpless, like you see in this photo of some starving children. Now, NGOs or nonprofits will use these images because it helps them engage in more in fundraising. They try to tug at the heartstrings. But if you look at this photo, I would virtually guarantee that these children didn't give permission for their photo to be used in a fundraising appeal, which this particular photo had, and I won't point to where it came from for that reason. But, uh, you know, when beneficiaries' images are used without their permission, it can be, it, it, it essentially is stripping them of agency. It's ignoring their right to be represented in the way that they want to be represented. And, uh, and it's a classic example of where helpers with good intention uh, engage in unethical behavior because they're ignoring the agency of the people they're trying to help. We will often use helping as a reason to engage in emotional manipulation. We'll use helping as an excuse to justify things like guilting and shaming somebody. This, is, uh, this ad by PETA is a good example of that. Uh, we might use uh, helping as an excuse to justify threats against another person. These could be anything, uh, you know, anything from like emotional or physical threats. And we might also use flattery and false affection. We might misrepresent our esteem that we have for somebody else because we think we're being helpful by doing that. This would be a, fund a fundraiser lying to a donor, for example, to make them think of how great they are when there's not really respect there. And last, uh, pro-social behavior instincts can also lead us into rule breaking. Now, <clears throat> there are examples of ethical pro-social breaking of the rules. Blowing the whistle, for example, revealing information that your company has told you to keep confidential. Uh, in World War II, hiding Jews was pro-social rule breaking. And we honor the people who did that. But at the time, it was violating the laws in Germany. And then finally, this idea of civil protests, where people are deliberately break the law in peaceful ways in order to draw attention to the, to the unethical nature of those laws. But 
Prosocial behavior can also lead to unethical rule breaking. And some examples of that would be helping a friend cheat on a test. You think you're helping this person out, but really you're both just uh, abandoning your own integrity. Vigilanteism is a good example of unethical rule breaking that's done for what they think are prosocial reasons. You know, when uh, people uh, sort of take the law into their own hands, they think they're doing it in the name of justice. Um, and then finally, violent protests, right, as a counterpoint to civil protests. And this is where people's property is destroyed or other, uh, you know, damaging or harmful things happen to innocent people in the name of protesting some injustice. Uh, the reason we'll engage in this sort of rule-breaking behavior is because the status quo and the rules in front of us aren't leading to the outcome that we think is right. Um, but uh, the way we decide to break those rules can be considered ethical or unethical, depending on the context. It's worth noting also that helping behavior and our instincts to, to be good to others don't just lead to our bad decision making, but they also can lead to bad assessments of leaders. And when we admire pro-social leaders, we're more willing to forgive their bad behavior. You know, people are more forgiving to abusive leaders. Uh, the research shows. And in fact, if you have a leader who demonstrated prior ethical behavior, and then the leader then engages in abusive behavior to you, the research shows you're actually more likely to blame yourself rather than the leader for the bad treatment because the leader's reputation of ethical behavior somehow excuses the bad decisions that they made. I have Elon Musk here because I think he's a great example of this right now. You know, he's done a lot of good for the world and pushing for more environmentally sustainable business practices. That's been the case with with uh, with uh, a lot of his different businesses like Tesla, for example, uh, all the solar stuff that he's built, which eventually got rolled into Tesla, but it was originally Solar City. Even SpaceX is a good example of this because it's, it creates a much more efficient and cost effective way to get things into space. Um, but all of these sort of stand in contrast to really unethical things that he's done and said, ways that he's defrauded investors, broken agreements with others, and so on. And yet he has these ardent devotees, fans who will never betray him. And they'll use his good behavior as a reason to justify or make excuses for his bad behavior. Now, how do we combat all of this? How do we deal with all this? Well, we follow, we, we use the same ethical tools we'd use to make good choices. And just to highlight three of them, having a, a good mastery of your values, clear, having clear values and putting them first so that you're, so you're making value-based decisions all the time is a really important way to do this. And so taking the time to really understand your own ethical values, writing them down, putting them to work in your decision making can help you avoid the unethical traps that uh, we see that happen to helpers. Uh, engaging in transparency, giving people access to key information and true motives is a way to make sure that we're always open to uh, discovery if we're unable to hide secret things we might do, ways we might misrepresent the truth, then that, transpar that transparency is going to encourage more ethical behavior from us. And then finally, it's good to have scrutinizers in our life, independent experts like a board of directors who can step in and assess our bad behavior. And there have been examples of this in the past where founders of, of successful nonprofits have eventually engaged in bad behavior and the board of directors steps in to hold them accountable. Uh, we can do this in our personal lives as well. In fact, having people close to us who can be honest with us are, are so, these people who can be close to us are so important to helping us make good choices and to see things with a more critical eye when we might be justifying our bad behavior for what we think are noble reasons. So this is a pretty short video, but in class, we're going to go into more detail on three examples. We're going to talk about Elizabeth Holmes. So she was a founder of Theranos, the blood testing company, who is now in prison because of her uh, uh, defrauding of investors. And that's what she was found guilty for. Arguably, she also defrauded patients. Uh, we're going to talk about what her motives and incentives were when she built up Theranos and how to this day she still thinks that she was in the right. Um, we're going to talk about Sam Bankman Freed. Sam Bankman Freed is the is the recently convicted founder of FTX, um, which was a big cryptocurrency exchange. But he was also a huge supporter. In fact, financially, one of the largest supporters. We're talking billion over a billion dollars of financial support to a movement called Effective Altruism. And we're going to talk about the way Sam Bankman Freed used his support of Effective Altruism to sort of cover his sins uh, with the FTX scandal. 
And then we're going to talk about, finally, Greg Mortensen. And Greg Mortensen was the founder of an organization called the Central Asia Institute. Uh, they built schools in Asia so that kids could have, in Central Asia, that, so that kids could have access to education. Uh, he also used the organization to gain a lot of financial, personal benefit because the, no, the nonprofit he started was primarily just promoting his book, for which he kept all the royalties. And so we're going to talk about each of these examples in turn and show how their desires and instincts to do good in the world created this moral license and, and opened the door for them to justify unethical means in the ways that we've already talked about. And I look forward to discussing all this in class with you, and I'll see you then.